So more life. What does more life mean to you? Depends on what, how old you are, right? And uh, we all want to have, as you're older, you want to have more life. But when you look at a two-year-old running around, you're like, can they have less life? You know, uh, after a bit. Um, soon after my son was born, I took the risk and I took him to the local library. And public libraries have always been my favorite places. But my son was not one who would take a nap. I doubt if he napped most of his... <laughs> well, now he might nap, I don't know. But so library time was difficult for me. But I got out the stroller and all the things that infants need and strolled into the library. Now, this was one of those libraries that the librarian was very careful that nobody made a peep. She did not want to have any noise, and so she, they actually would walk around and tell you to be quiet. So, so you can understand that I was a little nervous, but I strolled in up and down through the, the stacks of books, and I took some books down in a couple uh, magazines and sat by uh, an older gentleman, and um, he, he nodded and said hi. And if you have ever had a baby with somebody else, you know you're a little worried if everything's going to go well. But Ian was sound asleep. And the older guy looked at me and said, I'm jealous of him. And I... I was young, so I really didn't understand really what he was thinking. And I thought, well, you know, maybe because he's older or, or and, he, and this little guy has a, the whole life in front of him. I wasn't sure. And he said, he can sleep. I don't know how to sleep right now. He said, I can barely sleep. I can't stay asleep. And so we chatted some more and in very hushed tones and had a little glare from the librarian that walked by. And as we were talking, he was wondering, sharing with me, he was wondering if his life was worth living. And so we spent some time together. You know, it's true, when you're 55, you may not have as much energy as you had when you're 21. So what does it mean to have abundant life? When I was in chaplain training, we were taught to assess one's quality of life, and in particular, one's spiritual life. It wasn't so much, do you believe that Jesus is Lord or your Lord, but because I had found that anyone could say, yes, I believe. I want to take note that the blinds, it's really windy out, and so these blinds may have to go up. And if that's so, if you all scatter away from the light, I understand. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so, because it's very easy for us to, in our heads, say, yes, I believe. But in our hearts, it's difficult for it to come tr true. And so we were called to look for signs of life. How they greeted us when we walked in the room could tell us a lot about where they were spiritually and emotionally. How they interacted with their family members, or did they have visitors? There were two situations that struck me how full a life a couple of my patients were. One was a woman who was having her second leg removed and asked me to come and pray. I wasn't sure how my visit would be. I couldn't imagine having one leg removed, let alone two. And when I came in, Lois surprised me. She was sitting up in her bed, all dressed like she was expecting company. It actually, she had her jogging suit on, and she, she had her lipstick on, and her hair was all done, and by her bedside was 
a, a, a beautiful little flower arrangement. And it's like she had set up her home right there in that hospital room. Somewhere in the middle of our time together, I asked Lois where she experienced God these days, and her face just lit up. I don't remember what she said, but the joy that Lois experienced in spite of her situation bolstered my faith that day. Then there was Reverend Jackson, who was a United Methodist pastor in a city near my, uh, my, the hospital, and he was a beloved pastor. Everyone loved him, and he didn't have many visitors. Sometimes that happens to pastors. They think, oh, they're going to be fine, and so they don't get visitors. But his family uh, was there. He didn't ask for a chaplain, but since I was a chaplain on the oncology floor, I would go to every single room and just to peek in and see how folks were. And so I introduced myself to Reverend Jackson, knowing that I was just beginning to be a pastor and he had been a pastor for many, many years. And so it, it was a holy moment for me. I didn't know what I would expect there either because I had learned from the nurses that he was going to die very soon. And so I peeked in, and there he was sitting up in bed in his very brightly colored silk pajamas, wild. And it just made me smile. He, he was able to have abundant life even though his days on earth were few. And how was he able to have such hope? Not hope that he would live longer, but this deeper hope, this deeper sense of being connected to the divine and connected to eternal life. For one thing, Reverend Jackson cared for his spirit. He drew deeply from the well of joy, peace, and love. And he focused on the gifts that God gave him. But I don't think that was the only thing. It wasn't just a me and Jesus thing for Reverend Jackson. He had a community of friends, colleagues that he could rely on that would help him. Because, my friends, we need each other. Because we have been made for community. Even if you are an introvert and prefer having that quiet time to energize you, you still need others. A colleague of mine, uh, Reverend Cindy Arnold, tells a story of a Christmas Eve that she experienced before she became a pastor. She and a couple of friends had come together to the Christmas Eve service, and Cindy wasn't really feeling the Christmas spirit that year. The joy that everyone was singing about was actually making her feel worse, more sad. She says she begged God to let her feel God's fullness and presence. She wanted to hear God's guidance, to believe with all her heart. So there they came to that point in the service where you have your candle, right? Our favorite part of the service. And she, uh, she was there, everyone was rustling around getting their candle while the pastor spoke about the one true light coming into the world. And Cindy looked down at her candle and there was no wick. It was just a solid piece of wax. And she giggled with her friends to distract herself, uh, to hide her, her disappointment and her slight panic. But then what little Christmas spirit she had was slipping away. She wasn't going to be able to receive the light metaphorically or literally. 
And so she started to pick away at the candle like you may do when you feel like you cut the wick down too far, hoping that the wick would emerge, but it didn't. Well, without hesitation, one of her friends just grabbed her her wick and pulled out her car keys and started to whittle at her As a pastor, I was thinking of all the wax on the floor, but you know, she started to whittle at the wax on her candle, and sure enough, there a wick appeared. Her friend knew what to do, and even though Cindy had the tools, she had car keys, she could have done this, it was her friend who was able to to see it from a different viewpoint. And it was her friend's willingness to get the job done. So sometimes, my friends, our hearts aren't ready for God's flame yet. Sometimes there are barriers that separate us, barriers of fear and shame and guilt. There are walls of control and apathy and distractions. And sometimes, like Joseph and Mary and Jesus, there are outside forces that are hindering us from experience God's gift of life. But like my colleague Cindy Arnold pointed out, community can help us. Community can help whittle away at those barriers that keep us from being vulnerable enough with God to rally and let our hearts and our lives be open to God's presence. And even when we don't feel ready, they, the friends, the church, the family, can jump in and help us catch fire anyway. They help us just at the right time. The wick was always there, just as love, peace, hope, joy are always within us. And at times, they are so hidden and in need to be revealed that we need others to help us. I think I've said this many times during our Christmas Eve service just two nights ago. Christ is willing to be born anew in each one of us. Love came down so that we could have life, and that is good news. That is good news for all the people. We need each other to experience this life. I need you, and you need me. The person beside you or behind you, in front of you, needs your encouraging word. Maybe something more like whittling away at the barriers that are keeping you from truly living. Or maybe like the gentleman in the library who just needed a listening presence. I say just a, living pre- a listening presence because sometimes we rush in to help when what we really need to do is let go and just be with someone. And so... We ask God, who is love, to guide us, to guide us on how to be that person that helped Cindy, how to be like the messenger that helped Joseph and his family find peace and safety. And we ask God, what is my part in this? How can I help my neighbor who is struggling with many things, or the people we don't near the, know, the people that we help at the food bank, the food that we are bringing today, what more can I do, God, to help them find the wick, 
so that they can have more life. I believe that there are angels among us, right here in this room and in your homes, in our congregation. We can be messengers flying in the face of fear, taking the steps we, are, we need to allow life to flourish within us and within others, within our neighbors. Amen? Amen.